Peace everyone, Unmask Art here, and welcome to another time-lapse video. Today I'm sharing the process of the Thomas Kincaid copy and pastels that I did a few weeks ago. This project is on the art club, so if you want to follow along with this entire project, I did live stream it. I have links in the description for that, you can sign up. Otherwise, just sit back, relax, and enjoy the process. So I started off with the sky, very light layer, mapping out my colors, only used about four colors. And one of the important colors to mention is gray. I used a light, cool gray color for the foundation of the sky. And gray is a really important color in skies like this because the transition between yellow and blue, if you don't use a buffer in order to mix those colors together, and that buffer being gray, then you'll get green. And so you'll, you'll have a lot of skies that have colors that are complementary or mix to a color you don't want. Oftentimes purple and yellow will be side by side and you don't want those to mix because you don't want to make brown skies. And in this case, I don't want to make a green sky. So that's the secret color you need to use in order to mix opposing colors without getting a, a color you're not looking for, is to use gray as a buffer. So yellow transitions into gray, and then that gray transitions into the blue. And that's how you get those seamless gradients between those types of colors in the sky, whether it's a sunrise or a sunset. That's sort of the the secret of those transitions. Now I put in a little bit of the trees in the process of layering the sky. You can see the purple and a little bit of the teal color and some reds in the distant trees. And these distant trees, it was really important to keep them very soft. So I mainly used gray as the foundation and then gradually build up some of the saturation to bring out the purples and the reds. Now, once I finish the sky, I did three or four layers on it, if I remember correctly, and blended it out with a blending sponge there that you can see every once in a while, the blue handle. Once the sky's done, I put in the clouds and the clouds are relative, relatively easy. Just a little bit of the darker colors and some light scribbling. After the clouds put in, I just gave them a soft blend. I didn't want to move the pigments around too much. So I just blended them very lightly to soften them up, push them into the colors behind them. And then I started blocking in the trees with just a slightly darker gray. And this is to help differentiate the distance that these trees are in comparison to the softer trees behind them. So this uh, helps bring those trees forward a little bit, making them more contrasted against the sky. And then of course I begin layering the colors. I do red and purple. And then once I get sort of the body of the tree filled out with the leaves, then I come back in with my black pencil to sketch in a little bit of the tree trunk and some of the tree branches. And you'll notice that I don't add a tremendous amount of the branches running through the tree. I don't think that it, it needs a lot and Thomas Kincaid himself never added a realistic amount of branches coming through the tree. It was more of a more of a stylized 
toned down version of realism. And so that's what I did there. Uh, I switched up the colors, worked with some of the greens. And when it, when it comes to this project, I actually didn't use very many colors. I used about 16 different pencils for the entirety of this project. So those purple trees and those green trees, the bushes that you see me putting in now, and the bushes that you'll see me put in later, I, I used the same colors some gray, two different shades of green, and then I have a couple purple red colored pencils that I was using throughout to put in some of the flowers and whatnot. And the reason I do this, and this is something that I discussed throughout the project is, one, it's a lot easier to only use a few colors. If you limit yourself, then you're not you're not forgetting what colors you used where. It's a bit easier to just remember that you're working on something green than this is the green because you only have two of them. And that limited palette benefits you in another way and that's preserving the overall color harmony of the project. So all of these colors, they work really well together throughout the image because everything's made up of the same colors. The variation comes with added gray, black, and mixing those colors together in different ways. But really, no matter how much you mix these colors together, they all come from the same sort of family. And because of that, the, the color harmony works out without really putting any effort into it. And that just makes the finished product more harmonious. Now I'm starting to get down into the smaller bushes and foliage of the project. And again, same two colors of green throughout. And what I do is I layer down the green, the base green, and I use the black to establish the darker shadows to create the shape and depth of the foliage. That's really important to make the foliage look more three-dimensional as opposed to sort of keeping it flat. If you don't have, if you don't have the shadow shapes to create the depth in the foliage, then no amount of highlights are gonna give you that. Highlights are important, but shadows are far more important in establishing the form. So I keep this pattern going throughout all of the foliage and it's a relatively simple process of just layering down a base layer of green, establishing where some of those shadows are at, and then just piling up on some of the texture. There's no real detail in the bushes as much as it may look like there is. Scribbling down the base color green, as you can clearly see, there's really not a lot of technique to it. And then scribbling down the shadow placement. That's the, those are the two important factors of the bushes. And there's not a lot of drawing skill necessary for doing that. It's, it's relatively simple and straightforward. I think you can clearly see the, the approach on this bundle of bushes here in front of the, um, in front of the manor. And I just do the same process twice. So I laid down the green, laid down the shadows, laid down some of the other varying types of green, and then I repeated that process. But the way that I repeated that process is instead of scribbling down the pencil, I started to establish a little bit of underlying texture of the bush. So instead of lines, I was doing more of dots, and that helps create this illusion of leaves. 
And then once that second layer is down, the paper is covered a lot more, so the bushes just look more vibrant. And then I add the little flowers, which are just little dots of color. Nothing is drawn or anything like that. It's just applying some texture. Now over here, when I do the grass with the little dirt path going back into the woods, I remember that I discussed the importance of subtle texture changes. So with all the foliage, I did dots in order to create this subtle illusion of leaves. With the small patch of grass there in the back, I discussed using very small vertical pencil strokes in order to establish the subtle texture change between the grass and the bushes. Since grass grows vertically, I wanted to try to, as much as I could in that small space, and this is, it's relatively small, that little dirt path and that patch of grass there. So there's not much room for, you know, very precise details. But if you look at the grass patch and you look at the bushes that are alongside it, you can see a textural difference. It's very subtle, but it is distinctive enough that when you look at a bush and you look at the grass, you see a difference. And that difference is simply because when applying the grass, the color for the grass, and all the little shadows and highlights and stuff, I kept all of my pencil strokes vertical or relatively vertical. And that subtle texture change allows that distinction to come through. Now moving on to the to the roof here, the simple process that I used is to just fill in the roof. I just used a single single color of gray to fill in all the shapes. And then I used various other reflective colors to give the roof a little bit of variation, both in value and in color. And the colors that I use are just the colors that I've been using. So I threw in some of the green, I threw in some of the browns, and even some of the purples and reds. All you had to do to do this roof was to apply these these colors and just get some variation both in value and color. And then once you have that foundation done completely, I just took my black pencil and created all the, the shingles that separate the details. And then I come back with light gray and yellow to create some of the sunspots. And this technique is Again, very, very straightforward, not a lot of com complexity to it. And it doesn't really take a lot of drawing skills as I, as I broke down in the live stream doing the roof. The details, as far as the shingles go, they don't really follow perspective uh, truthfully. They're a little bit simplified um, in the, in the, perspective that this manner is drawn uh, it's really not uh, all of all the horizontal lines are are perfectly horizontal so it's it's almost as if it's forced into one point perspective because there's not a lot of perspective actually happening in this manner it's quite two-dimensional really the way that it's drawn in the original painting that Thomas Kincaid did now, when it comes to the rock siding of the manor itself, the technique that I used in the roof is the same exact technique that I use for the bricks or stone that the the manor is made out of. I don't I don't focus on any individual part. Instead, I build the foundation that the bricks are laying on. So I focus on getting that foundational color by mixing a couple grays and browns together. And I come back with the, the black pencil to establish a bit of the shadow in the form 
of, of the house. Once I establish that, you can see I add a little bit of the purple and blue and green and yellow to create some variation of color. And I just blend it out, get it a little bit smooth. Once I have that foundation, I come back with the white pencil and I start putting in all of the separating lines of, of the stone that make up the house. And one of the things that I mentioned here is that all of the lines are just horizontal. There's, there's no perspective in these lines and that's the way it was painted as well. So it makes it even easier to draw this because you don't have perspective to worry about, which is why when I, when I did the line art for this, I didn't draw in all of those individual bricks. Now, one of the things that stands out from the shingles of the roof that differentiate the way that I did the bricks is that I use, I use a dark brown color to create a few shadows on the left and bottom side of all the bricks, but not all the bricks. You can see the way that it brought out the texture and created a little bit more depth and making those bricks feel a bit less even and just more, more natural looking. And that's due to the direction that the sun is coming from. So you have those shadows on the left side and create some simple texture deep in the space between some of the bricks. Next thing is doing the lights from the windows. I just layered the yellow colors and the brown colors that I have continued to use. So the yellow color, same color I used in the sky, same color I used for the highlights of the bushes and even some of the flowers. The orangey color, again, same color I used in the chimney stacks that you see at the top of the house. And I also used that in the grass and in the trees or whatnot. The last thing I do after filling in the windows, I use that same orangey color, orange brown color to add the, the textures and the details in the windows. And then I use white to create a little bit of the light pouring out of the windows. After the windows are done, I work on the ivy that's covering the house. I wanted to I wanted to keep the ivy last for the house because I wanted it not only did I want the ivy to be on top of the house and feel like it's on top of the house, but I also wanted it to be on top of the colors that I had applied before. And so doing it this way just made more sense than if I were to put it in and then try to do the bricks around it. I always try to avoid, avoid situations like that where there's something laying on top of something else. I treat it like a, a project in itself where I do the background and then the foreground. Just the way that I've done this entire project. I worked all the way from the back and worked way forward. And uh, then putting in the ivy, I get to the lamp posts which are quite easy. I just put it in with, with the black pencil and use the same colors that I used for the light coming out of the windows of the house. So nothing, nothing new there. The next thing is to do all of the stone that make up the bridge, and the walkway. And this is identical to the house, to the manor. The technique was identical. The colors were identical. Everything about it was exactly the way that I did the house. So there's there's nothing new here. Keeping it simple, that's the way that I like to do it. Keep things simple. There's no, things don't inherently get better if you complicate it. So I like to keep things simple. Now, one of the things I did do that I did change was the shadows underneath the bridge. So I left those blank because they're significantly darker. And so I will come back through and apply a darker shade of gray underneath there to establish those, those values, as opposed to using these lighter colors. 
on underneath the bridge since they were so much darker. So I come through with the grays, the browns, blend it out, get things smooth. And once I, once I get this foundation color, this, this foundation color is just meant to establish the, the overall color of the stones. And then here you can see, come through with the darker gray to establish the value change that happens below the bridge and then varying other value changes throughout the stones, establishing a bit of the light direction and all of that. And then I do the same thing with the black pencil, come through, establish the darkest values that occur. And this is the, you know, the side where it's getting the, the least amount of light. So it should be obviously darker than the house since the house is getting quite a lot of sunlight. Once I get those value changes, again, I smooth it out with the blender. And I, I like to use just the paper blender here for smoothing pastel pencils. And then once I do that, I start working on the foundational colors of the, actually the walk path. And I use the same colors that I use in the windows and in the lamppost to create a bit of light sort of covering the ground. And I use those same colors to create a little bit of like a stone texture, a stone walk path or all of that. And it's really small. It's a little bit deceiving because my camera is zoomed in for most of this project. And so you, it's a little bit deceiving as to how small those details actually are because they are quite small. Uh, for instance, each, each little brick here that I've started to put in on the bridge and everything, which by the way, is identical to the way that I did on the house. I mean, each little brick there is a fraction of a size of your pinky fingernail. Like it's, they're tiny. So it's a little bit deceiving with my camera zoomed in on the scale of these details. Now, once I get the bridge all done, I start putting in the foliage. And as you can see, single, single color of green until I come back through with the lighter green and then the black to establish the value changes and the shadows and all of that. I use some of the orangey brown in there as well. And you can see over on the right side, that is, that is the ground with some grass and some weeds and stuff. And so you can, you can see the pencil direction changes to a much more vertical texture in that area. And you can clearly see the difference between like the ivy and the bushes, that texture versus the texture in the grass. And that's always something I emphasize when I do, because those textural changes, those pencil direction changes helps strengthen what the object is. You can tell that it's not a bush. You can tell that it's, that it's grass in comparison. The bushes are more like clouds and their texture are dots. Whereas the grass, all of the texture is vertical lines layered on top of each other. It's a small thing, but it makes a significant difference. Now onto the water, the last part of this project, the water was a lot of fun to do because it slowly comes more and more to life. And I, I talk you through this process in the, in the live stream of this project. And the first step is to just, just to establish the shapes. I don't establish the shapes based on color. And you can see I block them in very broadly and I continue to layer those same colors. So this is layer two, come back through with the black again to darken the shadows. And each time you layer, you add more texture. And the texture is, is very much like the grass, but instead of vertical, it's horizontal. So I just keep all my texture lines horizontal. And each time I come through with a new color, I'm sticking to those horizontal lines. That's it, just those horizontal lines establishing those shapes that I see in the water. And each with each new layer, the texture gets more and more 
detailed, if you if you want to say that. And the last thing I do is I come through with the blender and I keep my blending horizontal. And then I come through with the darks, I really get those dark textures. And then the last thing I do is the highlights. And here you go. This is the final picture, all zoomed out. Hope you guys enjoyed it. And I will see you next time. Take care. Peace.